grants to operate emergency assistance programs. So we don't want aid to be limited to these institutions. All students in Minnesota should be able to access this aid when, uh, when they need it, and that's why we're directly appropriating funds to uh, Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota systems. They'll be able to ensure that students across every campus have access to these funds. And since there's no central system uh, for private or tribal colleges, we're not appropriating directly to them. But this bill expands the EAPS funding pool so more schools can apply for and receive aid. Um, emergency grants not only keep students afloat, they help the health of our institutions. And you know we've heard about staggering enrollment declines. Our institutions are facing some as much as 40% over the last 10 years. And emergency grant aid to help students facing financial stress is an important tool uh, to keep students on track and make sure they finish their degrees. And again, point to that um, example in uh, California where they, they use that to make sure they could actually re-enroll in their courses. So. I would like to invite um, the additional testifiers to come up and share their stories. Uh, thank you, Senator Umu Verbein. Um, our first testifier will be virtual. Um, I'm sorry. I believe uh, we have uh, Paul Shepard online, who is the Interim Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs uh, with the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Uh, so uh, Mr. Shepard, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Are you able to hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Chair Fateh and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Dr. and I serve as the Interim Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at Minnesota State. I've had the pleasure of working with students, staff, and faculty throughout the Minnesota State system to develop and implement our comprehensive approach to addressing basic needs in security. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Providing students with access to emergency grants is an essential component of our approach to addressing basic needs in security. We know from listening to our students that many are just one unexpected financial emergency away from needing to make extremely difficult decisions that will likely interfere with their education journey. We also know from listening to our students and the research focused on the prevalence of basic needs and security among college students, that students impacted by basic needs and security are disproportionately students with underrepresented and underserved identities. We also know students impacted by basic needs and security often do not just experience one basic needs challenge. For example, students who experience food insecurity are also more likely to experience housing insecurity, more likely to experience unexpected financial emergencies and other forms of basic needs and security simultaneously. Minnesota State College and University affiliated foundations have made efforts to raise external funding to support college and university specific emergency grant programs. Statewide programs like the emergency grant program administered by the Minnesota Office of Higher Education also provide critical financial support to sustain emergency grant programs. The resources provided or generated through these efforts simply do not meet the demand presented by students for emergency grant support. We have heard from students and from faculty and staff who administer emergency grant programs that the available funding is distributed quickly. And once that available funding is distributed, emergency grants are not able to be provided until additional funding is identified or raised. The federal emergency grant program provided during the pandemic provided much needed support for many students. While this temporary measure made a difference for many students, the need for emergency grant support existed prior to the pandemic and will certainly be needed moving forward into the future. The availability of emergency grant support helps students to remain enrolled at their college or university and provide students with the opportunity to thrive. Research studies have demonstrated emergency grant support makes a significant difference in the ability of students to remain enrolled, succeed academically, and complete their academic program. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for consideration of this essential support for students, and thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify. Uh, 
thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, next up, we have uh, John Runnigan, who is the president of Lead MN, who is here to testify. Uh, so please come up. And also we have, I'm sorry, we also have uh, Henry Mingo, uh, who is also with Lead, Lead MN. So please come up and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Fateh, Vice Chair Putnam, and Ranking uh, Minority Member Duckworth, uh, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Runnigan. I am the president of Lead MN, the Student uh, Association for Community and Technical College Students. I am here today to speak in favor of Senate File 431, which is legislation that will provide emergency grants to students in need. First, I want to thank Senator Umu Verbaten for bringing forth such uh, impactful piece of legislation that will provide critical support to students in need. Temporary setbacks can place low-income students in vulnerable positions. These temporary uh, setbacks threaten their college careers and success. These complications aren't covered by traditional financial aid resources that are given to students, which many students rely on to make college affordable and accessible. These setbacks include, but are not limited to, extra living expenses such as rent, utility bills, uh, car repairs, health care, or child care. <laughs> Emergency grants provide a lifeline to students like me, but these programs were, where, were rare before the pandemic. The COVID relief money to higher education institutions were, was critical in helping so many students stay in school that faced job losses, medical expenses, and other unforeseen costs during the pandemic. Now that the pandemic is over, the need for these programs do not go away. This legislation is a great tool to give colleges and universities across Minnesota the ability to help vulnerable students complete their degrees. In fact, a number of states had emergency grants programs before the pandemic, from New York to Wisconsin to even here in Minnesota. A study in New York found that of the students receiving emergency grants, 94% were still enrolled in college or had successfully graduated or completed their program of study in the semester immediately followed receipt of their reward. That represents an 18-point increase in retention rates across New York campuses. Part of the success of this program is not just the grant itself, the process also increased students' awareness of the broader uh, range of support available for them on campuses and the surrounding community. Eight in 10 recipients noted that applying for the grant caused them to learn about other resources that they didn't know were uh, about beforehand. This type of program is so beneficial that Lita Men also launched our own emergency grant program to fill the need for community and technical colleges across Minnesota. Since 2020, Lita Men has distributed over $40,000 in $100 and $200 increments to students. One recipient shared, I am 33 weeks pregnant and am a high risk and unable to work. I am unable to work due to having recently had COVID while pregnant, and my baby is not growing as she should be. I also have 16-year-old son, 16-month-old child and husband. Money is tight all around, and we have a budget to cover just our living expenses. We greatly appreciate the assistance available. Another student shared, when my hours were cut, I struggled to pay the basic necessities slash bills like the electric and phone bill. Right now, my brother relies on me to buy groceries and keep the electric and heat on. I've had to allocate money to pay for bills before I can buy groceries. I go for a week or two without even having food, especially on the days I'm near due bills. The amount of money is small, but the impact is huge for each of these students. Minnesota for years has had a relatively small emergency grant program. This legislation will allow colleges and universities to scale up a proven program that will help boost retention and help more students obtain their degree. I now would like to pass to Henry Mingo to share her story on the impact of emergency grants. Chair Fate. Thank you. Chair Fate, Vice Chair Putnam, and Minority Member Duckworth and members of the community are the committee for the record, my name is Henry Mingo, and I'm a student at Minneapolis College studying graphic design. Like so many other community and technical college students, I struggle to afford college. I don't come from a wealthy family, and I work hard both inside the classroom and multiple jobs to barely make ends meet. Last spring, I was sitting at home with my fiance when we got the text that someone we had recently seen had tested positive for COVID-19. We waited the next few days hoping for the best, but very quickly we both became extremely ill and I was nearly hospitalized. This put us out of work for over two weeks and into an impossible financial situation. 
We weren't sure how we would cover food for the next few weeks, let alone rent and the medical bills associated with having severe COVID. The situation was dire for me as a full-time student, and it seemed I would ha have to take on additional debt or drop classes to be able to survive this financial hit. Instead, I applied to my campus's emergency grant program, and this was not the first time that I needed an emergency grant. Earlier in the year, I had faced a situation where I needed an emergency grant to cover housing, but it took a long time to pull together the documentation required to prove that I was unhoused due to COVID. And by the time I had pulled the documents together, the money for my campus's emergency grant program had run out for the semester. I found myself in significant financial debt trying to stay afloat. Luckily, the second time I needed the grant, my college still had money available. The grant of $2,000 helped us pay bills while we were sick with COVID. And today, I am still pursuing my college education and will be graduating this spring thanks to the help of my campus's emergency grant program. I am so grateful that the federal COVID relief funds were earmarked for students facing emergencies. But now that the money has been spent, this legislation will continue a program that has been proven to be effective at helping students continue on in college. I urge this committee to pass this critical legislation to support Minnesota students that face a bump in the road on their educational journeys. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I believe we have one more testifier who is gonna be coming up today. Um, uh, Sia Sakardande, who is a state coordinator with the University of Minnesota Undergraduate Student Government. So please come up and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Fate and members of the committee. My name is Sia Sakardande. I use pronouns like she, her, and hers, and I'm the state coordinator for the Undergraduate Student Government at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I'm here today in support of Senate File 431 because of how beneficial emergency grants have been to our students on campus, who are already financially strained with the high cost of tuition and the lack of affordable food and housing options. College students tend to live on an extremely tight financial budget that they have to stick to to make ends meet, to make ends meet every month. This may mean that towards the end of their budget period, they're running out of food or are forced to pay their rent or tuition later because the money just isn't there. Adding in an, in an emergency financial crisis means that students are left helpless. Our organization's Vice President, Zeke Jackson, shared his personal experience with the financial relief provided by the emergency grants, which I will be sharing with you all today. Zeke benefited from being awarded an emergency grant after he withdrew from a class that he was auditing. This withdrawal caused a reduction in his financial aid, which he was not informed of, and this meant that he would have to pay $400. Paying the $400 meant that Zeke would not have enough money to pay for groceries to feed himself. In receiving the emergency grant to pay the balance not covered by his financial aid anymore, Zeke was able to support himself again. On a campus of over 30,000 undergraduate students, Zeke is only one story of dozens of students who undergo similarly stressful financial situations and shocks, ranging from financial aid limitations to emergency medical procedures. Students should not be experiencing consequences for an emergency situation that they do not have control over, especially when financially supporting yourself through college is hard enough. Increasing awareness of these financial support systems that can assist students during hard times would be the first step to helping students through the financial crisis they face. Expanding these programs to support more people would be one of the ways that your committee would be able to help soften the financial burden of higher education. Financial assistance is often seen as a solution to the increasing cost of tuition, but when the costs of textbooks, food, and housing are also increasing, emergency funding would be one avenue that could cushion students who are already overworked and often undervalued and underpaid. By funding these direct emergency grants, your committee would be providing the support needed during times of crisis for many students across our campus and across our state, which is why the undergraduate student government of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is in support of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I think that concludes our testifiers. We'll now move to discussion and questions slash comments from our, uh, from our uh, committee. Uh, I see first we have Senator Duckworth with a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, 
for the author of the bill. I think I heard you say uh, what already is the kind of the base appropriation that's in place. Did you say it was 269000 a year, or am I making that up? <clears throat> Senator Overbain. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. Yes, yeah, so this, um, so Senate file 431 is uh, significantly, significantly <clears throat> increasing um, the appropriations, um, which were previously 269000 Mr. Chair, if I may. Senator Duckworth. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so as you alluded to it, you know, a fairly significant jump. And uh, so I'm, I'm asking what information uh, or data were you provided or that the folks that help you craft this, this bill provided that help us show or understand or predict why we might go to 269,000 to uh, about seven and a half million. Um, what were the, the data points and some of the information that was used to help determine the change for, uh, from that figure to the increased one? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Omu Rebain. And we also have, uh, proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. Um, I would say one of the, the biggest reasons for this is that our institutions got this influx of funds through the federal dollars. Um, we heard a direct ask from MinState for that $10 million because of the needs that they were seeing, requests that they were actually receiving from students. And um, being able to provide those funds and suddenly having that go away has put them in a really tough position. So what this bill is attempting to do is provide that funding on an ongoing basis so they can continue to address those needs. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Shepard, would you like to add anything else to that response? Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Duckworth. Uh, I, I think, again, just um, the only thing I might add is that we hear routinely from our faculty and staff at colleges and universities who administer these programs that the funds run out very quickly um, and that the, de that the demand greatly exceeds the available funding. Uh, thank you. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one final follow-up. Um, as students come forward with these requests, given their certain circumstances that they might be encountering, um, could someone give me an, an idea of the criteria the schools uh, give consideration to uh, before they approve a grant or allow uh, some of these funds to be given out to students, just to get a sense for you know the kind of questions they're asking or situations they're assessing? Thank you. Senator Omover Bain. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Duckworth. Um, I would love to uh, have Mr. Shepard uh, speak to that just from the experience of Min State taking in some of those requests. And then if we have some members from OHE here as well, I think they could speak to that a little bit better than me. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Duckworth. Uh, there is some variation in process at colleges and universities across our system. I think for the most part, there is um, a lot of emphasis placed on the application process being as simple as possible um, for students to uh, complete, um, but a robust enough of an application to, in, to kind of determine the need and, and provide some information to individuals that are making distribution decisions about um, what the circumstance may be and, and what's the best way in which um, the emergency grant could be deployed uh, to help with that particular emergency. So um, so there's kind of a, a balance there to strike in terms of making it easy for students to apply, um, but then also providing enough information to make an informed decision. Um, students are often in some cases involved in that decision as well. Um, but again, the point is to try to administer these funds as quickly as possible. Um, and to ensure there's enough information to demonstrate the need. Thank you. We also have Lane DeSalvo from OHE as well as Nikki Oliver, um, who would both like to speak to this as well. So please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Nikki Oliver. I'm the Director of Grants and Government Relations for the Office of Higher Education. I think um, Paul Shepard uh, answered your question more directly, but. Uh, for the office, we for the offices program that we run, um, we encouraged and um, implemented the competition in a way in which institutions would 
have their staff and departments talk across each other so there would be less of a burden on the students. So financial aid administrators would talk to the student support staff to know like the students' needs when they apply. I think part of the issue um, which was brought up is there's limited funding, so they have to kind of determine and prioritize the number of applications and who should get what with the limited funding. But I, I like Lane DeSalvo actually administers the program and work closely with the institutions on our program if they had any more things to add. Lane, you may proceed. You can just talk. Oh, <laughs> um, thank you, Senator. Um, for the record, my name is Lane DeSalvo. I work for the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. I'm the Competitive Grants Administrator. Um, I do administer the EAPS program. Um, so yeah, it is a really tough situation that folks are in who have to make those types of decisions when you're looking at two applications from students who are both in really dire situations. Um, it, it, is, it does vary, as Dr. Shepard mentioned, um, from, from institution to institution, depending on the availability of funds and the kind of need at the institution. Um, but some examples of criteria that are used are um, the student's uh, GPA, um, attendance, um, likelihood of retention, uh, the magnitude of the situation that they're in, the cost of the emergency relative to the amount of funds that they have available, things of that nature. It usually comes down to very tough decision making. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Uh, thank you, Chair um, and members. I'd like to also add that one of the key components of the EAPS programs are making sure the institutions are also directing students to other resources uh, to help with their needs. As, as Dr. Shepard had mentioned, um, a lot of these emergency needs have uh, systemic issues that need long-term addressing. So we uh, try to encourage uh, utilizing other resources and connecting students to those resources as well. So. Thank you. Senator Duckworth, any follow-up? Uh, yes, uh, briefly, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the information. It, it did. Um, uh, trigger one more question for me. Is there, maybe this is already in place, but is there any requirement to track the uh, successful graduation rates of students who receive emergency assistance student grants? Is that something that the, some of the institutions might take it upon themselves to already do? Do they not? Is it required or is there any thought to making that a requirement as well? Ms. Oliver. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I'll uh, allow Dr. Shepard to speak about the non ohi grant programs or uh, the way institutions do it, but for our uh, program, we do require reporting, and uh, that includes retention from semester to semester of participants. Dr. Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Duckworth. That is, that is something that I, you know, that we have heard um, is a part of um, how colleges and universities may assess the impact of the emergency grant programs that they have, um, and, and so I think that's um, certainly the intent and, and whether that's done formally or through the relationships that faculty and staff who administer these programs develop with students who receive grants, that's certainly something that um, our hope is, is that this will help them to be re remain enrolled until they complete their program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shepard. And I believe um, John Runnigan from Lead Men, who was here earlier, mentioned that 90% of students um, who received federal aid um, graduated. Very good. Mr. Chair, if I may, this is not a, a question, which is more of a comment. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Specific to this sort of investment, if it's if it's not a requirement that's spelled out in black and white, per se, it might be something we give some thought to uh, in terms of these appropriations and these grants. If there are ways that we can demonstrate just how successful they are at helping students stay in school and ultimately graduate, uh, it makes it that much easier to justify and get behind uh, appropriations like this. So just some food for thought on how we can measure the success and impact of something like this. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Uh, Senator Rerick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I've got a, a question in regards to uh, the money being appropriated for the three tribal schools. Uh, you know, it's my understanding that in the Min-State system and the U system, those schools administer that uh, program there on campus. Um, you started to touch base with the three tribal schools, but can you tell us, um, so my understanding in looking at this is that OHI is going to op 
operate that for those? And so why, why the difference? Why wouldn't we have those three campuses administer it on campus? Senator Umu uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, and Senator Rarick. So Min State and the University of Minnesota have um, the structure in place. There's not a central system for our private or tribal colleges, and so that is why we have the program administered by OHI. Senator Rarick. And if, okay. Uh, again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and yeah, Ms. Oliver, and Ms. Oliver this next Nicole. question is maybe gonna be more uh, for you as well then. Um, I, I guess a statement on that is I would think that uh, the schools, again, they're right there, the students are there with uh, people who would be making the decision, I would I would think they could follow the model, um, you know, like even just approaching Fond du Lac and getting the model that they use uh, to be able to administer that. But so then my next question is uh, the fifty thousand dollars that's going to OHI. Would that be specifically for the the five hundred thousand dollars for the tribal colleges, or is that part of the other program as well that you run, Miss Oliver? Uh, thank you, Chair. And Senator Rick, just to clarify, uh, so the current program is ran as a competitive grant. So the portion with the private colleges and tribal colleges will be ran the same way as a competitive grant. So the institutions will apply to us, and they would administer the actual distribution of the funds to their students on their campuses. Um, the $50,000, so the current program, we don't get any admin for. Um, so the increase in funding, and also because we are um, written in, in the language as it was amended, would need to work with Men State and the U on approving their kind of process for distribution, and then also still do a competition, which requires a lot of monitoring and all of that stuff that goes with grant operations. That's what the admin is for, essentially. Yep. Okay. Senator Eric. Good. Thank you. Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe, um, Ms. Oliver, you um, had said something about something that I liked. You said addressing the systematic causes. Um, and so that sort of leads to my question and a little bit about what Senator Duckworth said. Um, with a program like this, and, and maybe not this one specifically, but are there like financial counseling sort of requirements or services that are offered um, in relation to things like this? And, and I guess I'll give you an example. When I was in college, one of my roommates um, had a had a gambling problem, and that happened to be when Canterbury Park opened their uh, Texas Hold'em tables. So we'd get to the end of the month sometimes, and he would be like, well, I don't have the rent. Um, and my concern about a program like this would be a student like that would be going up against like kids that or young people that testified today. Um, and of course, I would prefer that they would get that sort of funding rather than so, you know somebody like my roommate who just gambled away all of his rent money. So. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any any component of like financial planning or anything um, with a program like this. Ms. Oliver. Chair and Senator, so the way we run the program is very, um, we, we leave things up to the campuses essentially, but when they, because it's a competition, they have to provide us a, an application to outline how they're going to distribute the funds, what they're gonna be looking at, what additional services and resources they're gonna be providing to students. And my assumption, and I don't know if Lane might have to confirm this with me, and maybe Dr. Shepard as well, is if they are seeing a student coming back repetitively asking the question of why and what's going on there and then assessing that, um, I believe, is one of the things they do do. Um, and again, that's why we also encourage connections with local and community services um, to provide like financial like planning and services. They might even offer the student uh, uh, some courses that offer financial planning. But again, we leave those things up to the institutions because they do know their students best. And, and the types of emergencies and types of students deal with vary across the campuses. And also sometimes it depends on the region um, and where the campus is located. But again, that's something we encourage in the program is that they are assessing how many times a student is coming to them, what the emergency is, and, and all of those, those things are kind of a part of the program we, we currently work with. And I think that's kind of the intent of having these systems um, develop a plan of distribution and relay that plan to the office for us to review and assess and then before approving distribution of the funds to the system. Senator Umu Verbatim. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, Ms. Oliver. And Senator Farnsworth, I just wanted to um, point out again one of those um, key highlights from the uh, 2021 annual report that talked about how Pell Grant recipients at under-resourced institutions were more likely to receive aid and typically received aid in higher amounts. 80% um, of the recipients were Pell Grant uh, students and then their average aid uh, uh, aid that they received was 2,000 compared to 1,200 for non-Pell Grant recipients. So there's some evidence, at least with the federal funds, that you know our institutions were getting that to at least um, one indicator of students that have, you know, that deeper need if, if they're receiving Pell Grants. But, you know, in those conversations that I had, had with Min State, they brought up a great point of, you know, those needs change. And um, there, there were students who, you know, lost jobs or had some, you know, unexpected emergencies that came up and, and needed to have that flexibility and not just tied to um, Pell Grant status. But, I just wanted to highlight that you know we have seen some success, and this is going to the students who need it. Uh, Senator Farnsworth, are there any other questions or comments? Senator, would you like to move uh, your bill? Mr. Chair, yes. Senator Umu Verbain moves that SF-431, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill as amended is laid over. Thank you. As I proceed with the next bill, uh, Senator Putnam or Vice Chair Putnam will be taking over the gavel. Thank you, Senator Fatay. I, I understand that you have uh, the A1 author's amendment. Would you like to move it? I suppose I should let you sit down first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would like to move the A1 amendment. Um, the amendment adds uh, private uh, nonprofit colleges um, just to get the bill into shape that we've all agreed upon. Chair Fertay moves the adoption of the A1 amendment to Senate File 655. Is there discussion on the motion? Comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The amendment is adopted. Right Senator Fertay, if you'd please uh, begin your presentation of the bill. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, I'm here today to present SF 655, a bill that aims to address uh, a major gap in higher education uh, by expanding post-secondary options for people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, this bill does two things. Uh, first, it establishes a technical assistance center that will provide expertise in, high, in uh, inclusive higher education. And second, it provides a competitive grant funding for two and four year colleges and universities, uh, as well as private colleges to start inclusive higher education initiatives. The outcomes speak for themselves. Students with intellectual disabilities who attend post-secondary education are more than twice as likely to be employed, live in homes of their own, and rely less on government supports like SSI and vocational rehab. This will strengthen the Minnesota workforce, reduce dependence on more formal, costly supports, and lead to long-term cost savings for the state. More importantly, it will ensure Minnesotans with intellectual disabilities uh, have the opportunity to pursue, to pursue their dreams, live the lives of their choice, and feel a sense of belonging in their communities. Today, you will hear from advocates in support of expanding inclusive higher education in Minnesota. Also in your packets, you will find uh, is a one-pager explaining the bill, several letters of support, and written testimony from, prospect from prospective students and parents across Minnesota urging the committee to support this bill. This demonstrates the broad consensus around SF-655 and how impactful this would be for so many Minnesotans and their families. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Fertain. Now we move on to testimony. Our, we have a, a mix of virtual and in-person testifiers today. Our first testifier is virtual. Mr. Valentini, if you would please uh, unmute your microphone, uh, turn on your camera, and say your full name for the record and commence your testimony, please. Hello, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for having me today. For the record, my name is Dr. Brian Valentini, and I am Assistant Professor of Special Education at St. Cloud State University. I'm here to support inclusive higher education and the efforts to advance SF655. I would like to start by establishing the why, why inclusive higher education programs. In Minnesota, individuals with cognitive disabilities earn approximately $16,000 per year, which is far below the median income. Only one in 40 individuals with a cognitive disability enroll in a college course. That is simply enrolling, not graduating. Unemployment rates for individuals with developmental disabilities exceeds 50% across the country. The outcomes for in, in individuals with disabilities are bleak. Yet, 80% of Minnesotan parents want their child with an intellectual disability to attend college. 80% of parents nationwide want their son or daughter to be employed in competitive and integrated settings. Minnesota and the people with disabilities that reside in the state want and need avenues to improve the aforementioned outcomes. Inclusive higher education programs are only one avenue, yet Minnesota is one of only two states remaining that do not have a four-year program for individuals with an intellectual disability. The inclusive higher education programs discussed in the legislation before you are not new. Some programs are more than a decade old. As such, much research has been conducted on these programs. In these programs, retention rates exceed 80%, Placement in competitive and integrated employment exceeds 70%. Student high school graduation rates exceed 75%. And certificate or degree completion exceeds 70%. The numbers resulting from inclusive higher education programs enrollment are astounding. At St. Cloud State University, we have worked with five local school districts, six administrative offices, and over 100 families to create a model of, of our initiative for our university, campus, city, and state. The legislation before you would dramatically increase enrollment, increase the workforce development, and enhance the quality of life of hundreds of individuals with disabilities. I'm asking the Senate to pass SF655 and support it all the way into action. I wanna thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Valentini and go Huskies. Uh, our next presenter is also virtual. Uh, uh, Mr. Robinson, if you would please uh, unmute your microphone, uh, turn on your camera, uh, say your full name for the record, and commence your testimony, please, Mr. Robinson. Chair Fate and committee members, my name is Gage Robinson. Thank you for the chance to for the chance to testify in support of inclusive higher education and Senate file 655. I recently completed high school. One of my goals is to go to college. I am interested in public speaking, web design, nonprofit organization, and cabinet making. I want to explore careers in my interest areas. School has not always been easy for me. When I was younger, I spent most of my day in a self-contained classroom with other students with disabilities. I love to learn, I just learn differently and I need more time. I love being in class with peers and friends without disabilities. I really enjoyed woodworking class. I want, I want to go to college, be with students my age, and be a part of the campus community. Today, there are no Minnesota college options that are a good fit for me. 
I need more choices to go to college and be successful. Inclusive higher education will provide me with college access and the supports I need. I want to be seen as capable I am. I want to keep learning. I am a lifelong learner. I am more than a disability. I am a nephew, a friend, an athlete, a public speaker, a nonprofit leader, a woodworker, and a prospective college student. I need the opportunity to go to college I can be successful and have the career of my choice. I ask you for support for the Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Act, like me. All Minnesotans with an intellectual disability are worth it. I ask that you support Senate File 655. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Our, our next testifier is also going to be virtual. Uh, so Dupree Edwards, if you would, please uh, turn on your camera, unmute your microphone, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony, please. Hi. If you can hear me, my name is Dupree Edwards. Um, chair for Ty and members. Um, again, my name is Dupree Edwards. Thank you for the chance to testify today in support of Senate File 655, the Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education. Um, I want to go to college in the performing arts. I like acting and music. I'm an older student. I have an intellectual disability. I have career dreams and I want to live on my own. In 2019, I enrolled in a two-year college, but it did not work out. I was required to take basic classes that I was not interested in. The class supports that I were offered made me feel like someone was doing the work for me. I did not feel like I was a part of the class. I ended up dropping my classes. I need access to the classes I wanted to take. I need access to the supports that helps me be successful. Inclusive higher education would eliminate the basic class requirements and give me access to the classes I wanted to take and the support I need. Today, I have a part-time job as an upstream arts teaching artist. Artists that I work with have college degrees for college degrees for my performing arts career goals, and I need a college education too. I want to earn a college certificate in the performing arts. I need access to a college that is close to home, near public transportation and affordable. I want a full-time career in the performing arts. We need more Minnesota college options for students like me to earn a certificate or a degree and have a career of our choice and live more independently. I ask for your support of Senate File 655 for the Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Act. Thank you, members and book and Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. Uh, our next two testifiers are in person and old friends of our committee. Uh, Jean Hoff, if you would like to begin, please, first, would you state your full name for the record and commence your testimony? Chair Fahad and members, my name is Jean Hoff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. In the spirit of Senate Fire 655, I want to share with you my college goals and experience. My goal is to go to college just like my siblings. I'm interested 
in a career in medications, also some media. I want to learn more about graphic design and technology. I'm looking for a four-year college with on-campus housing and a four-year certificate. My first choice is to go to college in Minnesota and closest to home. Today, there are no Minnesota colleges that admit students with an intellectual disability and offer a four-year certificate. I am ready to go to college now. Why do I have to wait? I have some college experience. I took college classes in high school. I have applied to out-of-state colleges. I was accepted at a Pennsylvania University. It was fun to live on campus. I like making my own decisions and the freedom. Taking classes with my peers give me confidence and make me happy. I complete two years of college, but then the first day stopped taking out of state students. I want to finish my college certificate, earning a post secretary consensual will help me with my career goals. I want to live and work in Minnesota. I want to continue my college education in Minnesota. The Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Act will expand Minnesota college choices for students with an intellectual disability. I ask that you support Senate 5655. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoff. Our next testifier is Mary Hoff. If you would please your full name for the record and then commence your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Mary Hoff. I'm testifying in support of Senate File 655. I'm a parent advocate and the co-leader of the Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Consortium. I can talk all day about inclusive higher education facts and figures, but will focus my testimony on why Senate File 655 deserves your support. As a parent of four college-age adults with disabilities, I have lived experience advocating for students with disabilities. My children are capable, lifelong learners who want to continue their education through college. As my daughter Jean testified, she wants to go to college and prepared just like her siblings. Today's student's testimony and the submitted written testimony are representative of over 5,000 college-age Minnesotans with intellectual disabilities. Unfortunately, today, less than 3% of college-age Minnesotans with intellectual disabilities have access to college in Minnesota, woefully short of Minnesota's 70% attainment goal. This is the first reason why Senate file 655 deserves your support. Inclusive higher education is about opening access to post-secondary education and widening the path to prosperity. Students with intellectual disabilities who attend college experience higher employment rates, earn higher wages, live more independently, experience healthier and happier lives, and have a sense of belonging. This is the second reason why Senate File 655 deserves your support. Colleges and universities with an inclusive higher education initiative benefit from including students with intellectual disabilities. The campus community becomes more welcoming and accepting. Faculty gain instructional strategies through universal design for learning to help support the success of all their students. This is the third reason why Senate File 655 deserves your support. Minnesota has a workforce shortage. Minnesotans with intellectual disabilities who earn post-secondary credentials are part of the solution and will contribute to Minnesota's economic growth. They are capable and untapped. 
This is the fourth reason why the Senate File 655 deserves your support. Inclusive higher education is a national movement that started in 2008. Minnesota lags behind and is losing prospective students who go out of state for college. States that have made a similar investment as proposed in Senate File 655 have experienced significant growth in post-secondary education options for students with intellectual disabilities. Senate File 655 provides the framework for inclusive higher education in Minnesota. This is the fifth reason why Senate File 655 deserves your support. Expanding college initiatives to include students with intellectual disabilities is possible right now. There are over 50 faculty from 25 different colleges and universities in Minnesota that are interested in inclusive higher education. However, new resources are critical. While grant funding, or excuse me, with grant funding and Minnesota-based technical assistance, the colleges and universities will get what they need and the positive momentum will continue. I ask for your support for Senate File 655. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hoffar. Uh, we're doing fairly well for time, and the understanding is that there are some other folks who might have some interest in testifying, so we'd like to, at this time, open it up. If there's anyone else who has uh, anything that they'd like to add to this conversation, feel free. All right, then. Uh, members, do we have questions or comments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I saw one of the co-authors sneak out right away when this bill came up, so I was immediately suspicious. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That co-author, of course, is Senator Rarick. Uh, appreciate all the testimony today. It seems like a worthwhile cause, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing the state of Minnesota make some progress here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Other comments or questions from members? Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I won't hold it against you that you forgot my name. Um, so, so I guess my question is, is it's more of looking for clarity. So I know that, uh, at least I, I believe that every college in the state has um, disability coordinators or coordinators, whatever their term is. So it seems like this would be a program that would help to support what they're doing in the schools, or am I wrong? Is it, is it something different than what they're doing? Senator Fate or anyone else? Phone to Nikki. Ms. Hoff? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, in, in, inclusive higher education is specifically for students that generally do not meet the typical admission requirements. So it, it, it can be set up where it's expanding the disability services and supports that are already available on the campus. Uh, it just depends on how the university or college sets that up. Senator Farnsworth. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, one last question. So for those who don't know, my history is, is a special ed teacher in Hibbing. And so I'm just sort of wondering at the, at the college level, what sort of accommodations or um, services would, would you envision that would be provided? Um, because obviously this is something that I support. I'm just more curious about how, the, how it would play out in real life. And that, that'll be my last question, Mr. Chair. Ms. Hoff. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator. So uh, the, the way inclusive higher education works is that there are supports that are provided. Generally, there's a, a small staff um, that's specifically dedicated to the inclusive higher education, and then they rely on uh, peer mentor support. So that, that helps with some of the academics, some of the social, some of the independent living. Um, and then, again, it depends on how the university or college uh, organizes or sets that up in terms of um, the type of support that the student has relative to accessing the, um, the classes on the campus. Members, any other questions or comments? Senator Fate, would you like to make your final comments? It's already on. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, everybody that uh, worked hard on this. This is a bipartisan bill. Uh, Senator Duckworth mentioned earlier that Senator Rarick is also uh, a chief author, uh, co-author on this bill. I want to thank all of them um, for supporting this. Um, as you heard from the testimonies, that the overwhelming majority of parents want to see their child have the opportunity to go to college. And I think we have the opportunity to provide that for them. Um, you've heard testimonies from students, from the kids. Um, you heard uh, Ms. Jean Hoff speaking about how 
uh, she wants to go to school for communications and graphic design, seeming very ambitious, right? And um, she wants to be able to go to college and stay on campus and be around her peers. Um, and right now, she just doesn't have that opportunity. Um, you also heard uh, Mr. Mr. Robertson speak about his goals and what he wants to get accomplished. And um, he, he too seemed ambitious, but again, he just does not have the opportunity at the moment. Um, he made, uh, Mr. Mr. Robinson made a comment that uh, he wants to be seen as capable, right? Uh, he wants to be seen as capable, and right now we have a chance to make him, to make him, to let him know that um, not only he's capable, but he's valued, and we care about them. So um, let's work together to make this make this a reality. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Fate. Uh, Chair Fate, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move this to be. Um, I would like to move this bill. Chair Fate moves that Senate File 655 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion. This bill as amended is laid over. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for participating today. Uh, this Tuesday, we'll be um, hearing an overview of the governor's budget and also a technical change bill as well um, from the agency. So uh, that's what we got. This uh, committee is now adjourned.